Amen, amen, amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Church, it is so important what we say. It's so important how we say it. And it's very important what we are saying to the world. And I, th- I hope that if you are saved today, you are very bold in proclaiming that truth uh, to the world. You know, there's a world that's dying out there. And there's a lot of things that are being said. And dare the church ever say things that aren't really pointing to Jesus Christ. I know today in our Sunday school lesson, we were really talking about encouraging one another. Um, there, there's an amazing passage that we're going to look at today that really gives us hope. This week, I've talked to a lot of Christians that are really, we were living in some serious, crazy times, and everyone needs encouragement, everyone needs hope. And so today, I pray the scripture um, will do that for you today. If you remember a couple years ago, I shared a scripture with you, and it was about the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you go back to some of our videos, it was uh, Jesus equals purity. And I just wanted to read that again to you today, to kind of uh, start this this morning. So let's go to your uh, Bibles, open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, or we'll go to that first slide today. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now this is what that uh, message was about, Jesus equals purity. But 1 John 3 one through three. It says, um, look at how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children, and we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. Did you hear that? What we will be say will be, has not been revealed. We know that when he appears, talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, we know that when he appears, we will be like him. Woo! The Bible says we'll be changed in a twinkling of an eye. We will be like him because we will see him as he is. And so when we behold Christ, when we see him in all of his glory, we also will be changed. And then finally in verse 3, And everyone who has this hope in him, the hope that when we see him, will be changed to look exactly like him, purifies himself. Or literally, we're pure because of this hope that we will be changed. Just as he is pure, we also are going to be pure. And so, church, you remember when we looked at this, um, it, it was just this amazing hope that we have when Jesus Christ returns. When we look at Jesus, in Jesus's presence, when we look at Jesus Christ, I will be changed in the twinkling of an eye to be exactly like him as he is. I am. And he's without sin and he's perfect and he's whole. He doesn't have anything wrong with him physically, mentally, and emotionally. He's 100% perfect, isn't he? Jesus Christ. And when he comes back, church, I and you, as we behold his glory, we also too, if we're, if we're tearing here um, until he comes back, we will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. It's not even like a, a millisecond. It's just like, bam. As soon as you see Jesus, as soon as you're in his presence, you, you can't help but change. All of your sin, all of your pain, all, all, everything caused because of sin is going to be reversed. It's just going to be totally restored. It's going to be totally renewed. It's going to be totally redeemed. Woo, amen. And that hope, that hope that one day I won't be like I am now. Praise God, my family says amen. When I see Jesus, I won't be this way forever. I will be changed. And so today you might have a lot of ailments in your bodies. You might be mentally and physically just tore up in pain and anxiety. Ooh, church, when we see Jesus, we're going to be changed. Oh, glory, hallelujah. And just the hope, just the hope of me being changed to look more like Jesus Christ and be exactly like Jesus Christ purifies me now. And so, church, we know this big word is called sanctification. It means that we're becoming more like Jesus. His hope is that we look more and more like him every day, that we look more like Jesus tomorrow than we do today. And one day, church, when we're in, finally in his presence, we'll be completely changed to look exactly like him. I'm telling you, the presence of Jesus changes things. Church, did you know that? Just the presence of Jesus just changes circumstances, changes our emotions, changes our actions. Folks, that's why I think it's more important than ever. God is revealing to us this theme of the year, which is redeemed. And a big part of that 
is that God's presence, when God comes and is in our presence and we're in his presence, folks, we'll be completely redeemed of everything wrong in this world. And now this, uh, this week, I, I did talk to quite a few people that we're just emotionally a wreck, aren't we? I, I mean, I, as my family and I had gotten COVID last year, uh, there was a couple times where I just, man, I just, I just said, Lord, take me. I, I just wanted to die. I just was like, take me now, um, please. I, I just want this, all this pain to be over with. Um, but church, as, as we honestly begin to pray and seek his presence, even his presence now in the flesh changes things. And we know one day everything's going to be changed in his presence. And so I want to encourage you today that uh, we desperately now more than ever need to seek the presence of Jesus Christ, church. So even right now in, in your quiet place, at your home, maybe you have some family members gathered around you, just pray the simple prayer. Pray, pray, Lord Jesus. And you might not even be saved. You might not even know God, but just pray this prayer with me. Say, God, I, I want you to be around me today. I, I want you to be in my presence. I want to be in your presence. This preacher is saying some amazing things happen, happens in your presence, and so, Lord, I need that because right now, even right now, I'm even committing or thinking about committing suicide, or, or maybe right now I am so depressed. I'm just so worried. I, I've got so many anxieties. I've got these ulcers, and I've got bowel problems in my head, and oh, so many problems in my physical flesh because I know it's from worry. Lord, I don't want that, and so I'm going to try you. Please, please right now, come uh, be with me. Be in be in me, be around me. Let me feel your presence and your peace. Oh, glory, hallelujah. You know, we learned a couple weeks ago that there is no evil in God. Evil is sin, it's from the devil. It's, it's from all the consequences of sin. In the presence of Jesus, there definitely is fullness of joy. And even Jesus said, as we pray, we're supposed to pray, oh, oh Father, uh, thou kingdom, thy kingdom come. You, you know, you, we want his presence here and now. And so today we're going to be back in Isaiah. So turn your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah 35. And I think God has purposely put us in Isaiah because there's so many amazing promises in Isaiah. Now, leading up to chapter 35 of Isaiah, Isaiah is, is really declaring to the children of Israel how sinful they are and how bad they've been and the consequences and the judgment that's coming because of that. Now, I'm going to tell you, church, and let this not be mistaken. There is a judgment coming. There is consequences for our sin. There is going to be a day where you're going to have to stand and really, you're, you're going to be accountable for all of your wrongdoings. Judgment is coming, church, and it might already be upon us. But oh, chapter 35 gives us a hope out of the problems, the situations, and the sin that so easily Become us, church. So if you will, let's read this in Isaiah 35. Let's go, excuse me, yeah, Isaiah 35, starting in verse 1. This is really prophecy about the coming Messiah. Not only this is prophecy about the coming Messiah, but it's also the promises of the second coming of the Messiah. But look at this in Isaiah 35, starting in verse 1. This is kind of what happens when Jesus shows up. This is what's going to happen when Jesus' presence returns to the earth. And my title, it's actually titled in my Bible, The Ransomed Return to Zion. But maybe if there's a title of this sermon, it would be Redemption in the return, because when Jesus Christ returns, there's going to be redemption. We will be completely redeemed. But look at this in Isaiah 35, verse 1. It says, the wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a rose. Or literally, this is a, a meadow, chaffron. It comes from northern Israel, so maybe not like a, a, a rose that we think of here in America, but flowers nonetheless. In verse 2, it says, it will blossom abundantly. Literally, this is bloom, bloom in the Hebrew. These things are going to blossom and bloom abundantly and will also rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. These are very beautiful places over in Israel. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Now, church, did you see that? Here, it says that when Jesus Christ returns, when, when the presence of God returns back to earth, the wilderness 
and the deserts are going to be happy. <laughs> They're going to be happy that Christ is returning. Now, a lot of times, you know, metaphysically, uh, if we look at this metaphorically even, uh, we in ourselves, we're barren, aren't we? We're, we're in a wilderness. We're in a dry place. We're in a desert season of our lives. When Jesus Christ returns, we'll definitely be glad. But this is talking about the physical realm of this earth. Folks, when Jesus Christ comes back, the most barren places in the world, the most dry places of the world, the most wilderness places of the world, where there is no hope, there is no nourishment, there is no sustenance for life there, it's dead. There is no life. When Jesus Christ comes back, life will spring forth out of death. Amen. Jesus Christ is life. That's why he says, I want to give you life and life more abundantly, church. We don't even know life until he comes back. We really don't even know life until we're truly in his presence. You just think you're alive right now, but really, we're probably just dead in our sins if you don't know Jesus. And we as Christians, church, our lives can get dry and barren and not be uh, productive and not be fruitful if we're not in his presence. That's why the word says that we need to abide in him. And as we abide in him, he abides in us. And we bear fruit through him. But it says here, the wilderness and the dry land will be glad. And literally, this desert, they're, they're going to blossom and bloom and bloom. I just love that. Now, these places over in Israel that it's mentioning that the wildernesses are going to be like are amazingly beautiful. I, I've seen pictures. I pray one day, God, and I will one day uh, be there. My feet, my physical feet will touch ground there. I don't know if it's in the millennial reign of Christ, but I'm longing for the day. I see this beautiful valleys. There's places over there that are literally oases in the desert dry places. Now, when Christ returns, all of those barren places, all of those places where there is no life, where there's our only death, Christ is going to sprout physical flowers. These are going to be, this is physical. Church, when the second coming of Jesus Christ happens, all of these desert places are going to bear all of these meadow flowers. Whew. What is such a, a beautiful illustration, a, a picture of Christ being life. And, and in his presence, church, there is life. Say there is life. Church, if you're barren in any area of your life, I'm telling you, in the presence of Jesus, there is truly fullness of joy as we're going to see here. But let's go to the next slide. Let's continue here in verse 3. It says, strengthen the weak hands, steady the shaking knees, say to the cowardly, or literally this is fearful hearted, this is what we're supposed to say, be strong or literally courageous, do not fear, here is your God, vengeance is coming, God's retribution is coming, he will save you. Then, it says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will spring for joy. Woo! Oh, glory. <laughs> there are some opposites here that happen. They're one way, but when Jesus Christ shows up and in Jesus Christ's presence, the way it was is going to be turned 180 degrees the other direction. Church, whatever we're fearing now, whatever we're going through right now, whatever brings pain and suffering and travail in this world right now, when Jesus Christ comes back, it'll be turned 180 degrees, the opposite way. Where it was curse, now it's a blessing. Where it was death, it will be life now, church. I love this. It, it's literally an encouragement to us. When I come back, there's going to be restoration, and even these flowers are going to bloom, and and here I almost see this as, as a Christ telling us to bloom like a flower as well, church. Church, now more than ever, like our Sunday school talked about, we need to be encouraging uh, words and encouragement to one another. We need to be an encourager, don't we? We need to go to those that are weaker than us in the faith. We need to go to those that have no hope. We need to go to those that are literally just mentally anguished and, and in travail. Hey, we need to tell them something, don't we? We need to bloom, if you will, to put life into their lives. It says, literally, we are to strengthen the weak hands. Now, these weak hands, it's like a feeble hand. It's a hand that doesn't have any strength and also steady the shaking knees. I'm going to tell you, God doesn't want you to have weak hands, and he doesn't want you to have your knees a-knocking. Amen. Look, church, there's a lot of things we don't do in this life because we are in fear. There's a lot of things that can bear fruit and bear life, but it's because of fear. 
it says that we have weak hands and shaky knees. We're not very fruitful a lot of times. We, a lot of times we have withered hands, if you will, and we're not able to, to work appropriately or, or, or purposefully sometimes. And, and a lot of times it's because our knees are shaking and our knees are knocking. I love those, those cartoons. You remember those old cartoons? Their knees were just a knocking back and forth, and they're so petrified and so scared. Church, we are supposed to go to those that this is happening to and encourage them. And literally, this is a picture of mankind. We were like this. And then Jesus Christ came and strengthened us, didn't he? This promise was actually fulfilled in the, re- in the first coming of Jesus Christ. Now the, the first coming of Jesus can and does strengthen us, doesn't it? It does give us hope. And it, we shouldn't have any fear. But still, church, today, don't we? Still, in our own hearts, you know, we worry a lot of times. We have a lot of anxiety a lot of times. But I'm telling you, we can say to those people that are like that, there's hope. And it's in the presence of Jesus. Because look at this. This is what we're supposed to say to those people. Be strong, or literally, be courageous, and do not fear. Here is your God. Vengeance is coming. God's retribution is coming. He will save you. Now, the save you literally is, is, is Yasha in Hebrew. It means Yahshua. It's the same word used for Yahshua or Jesus. We're supposed to tell the world. And those that are feeble and weak and scared, petrified, literally, hey, be courageous. Hey, don't fear. Here's your God. He's he's coming. He's going to come. He's actually bringing vengeance and retribution. Hey, you don't have to worry about your enemies. You don't have to worry about your naysayers. You don't have to worry about your haters. Hey, look, God is coming, and he will rescue you. Oh, glory. Amen. Amen. And church, these words that we speak to one another and we speak to the world are so important. Be courageous. Do not fear. Our God is near, amen? And he's coming with vengeance and retribution and he will save you. It's powerful, church. God's coming to save you. Yes, you. You're sitting and you're watching this right now and I'm speaking specifically to you. Yes, he's gonna come and save you. Your circumstances, as bleak as they may seem, it's, it's not always going to be like that. It's not. Now, if you commit suicide and you don't, haven't put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're going to have to live with that torment your whole entire eternity. Don't do it. Trust in Jesus. He's coming. He's coming for you, and He will save you. And all of that pain, all of that travail, Will go away. You see, church, in the presence of Jesus, there's hope, there's life, there's help. We're not alone. Here he is. It's almost in Hebrew, it's saying, look, he is already here, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he can be with you right now. And as you begin to allow him in, you're going to be overwhelmed, as we're going to look at here in a minute. You're going to be overwhelmed with his presence and overwhelmed with his peace and your circumstances supernaturally. God can restore. I love that. This is so powerful because when this happens, it says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. We could be talking about spiritually. We could be talking about physical, actual physical. When Christ returns, look, there ain't going to be any physical ailments. But even spiritually, we're going to be able to see clearly. Mm. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Well, I think this is very funny. We're supposed to declare to the deaf, hey, be courageous, do not fear. They can't hear us. Folks, there is something supernatural in these words that Jesus is coming back, oh, and it's going to be good. And as this word comes out of your mouth and goes into the world, his word doesn't come back void, does it? No, amen. And even those that can't physically hear you, somehow supernaturally, spiritually, they absorb these words of God and they can be healed. I love that. Then the lame will leap. The lame won't just get up, but they'll leap for joy. Literally, they'll get up like a deer and leap, man. And a tongue of the mute will sing for joy, and water will gush. I'm going too far. (laughs) But, folks, you can't sit still when Jesus shows up. You, 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 You won't be in any agony when Jesus shows up. You won't be in any pain. You won't be in any sorrow when Jesus Christ shows up. Church, this is prophecy. When the Messiah showed up, You couldn't be sick around Jesus. (laughs) Amen. 
Jesus' presence is more contagious. And I've loved, I've heard this said before. Jesus' presence is more contagious than any disease, any suffering, any sorrow, and any sin that you might be in. Oh, friends, when the presence of Jesus comes around us and fills us and overwhelms us, problems, physical problems. Also, we could be talking about uh, spiritual problems as well, can't we? Church, in the the presence of Jesus, whatever is troubling us will be turned around 180 degrees. And I love this. When I first got saved, um, sweet, sweet uh, sister of Christ, she ended up kind of being my spiritual mother, and I just, I loved her so much. She was actually from Sri Lanka. Hey, uh, shout out to all of our Sri Lankans that might be watching right now, but she was a sweet, sweet um, senior uh, adult from Sri Lanka. She was so sweet. And I know I've shared this story before, and, and I'd have a lot of problems. I was just a new Christian, and I would say, what about this or what about this? And, and she would say, oh, have you prayed about it? <laughs> and I'd say, no, that's too easy. <laughs> She's like, oh, Carl, in the presence of Jesus. Those things won't seem so troubling. In the presence of Jesus, you will have answers. In the presence of Jesus, you will have peace. You will have peace. I just just love the presence of Jesus. Now, a lot of times, uh, don't we? We we, um, don't like being in the presence of Jesus, do we? I always thought Jesus would be a joy kill. Uh, I was partying and always enjoying myself too much, and I didn't want to be around Christians. I didn't want to be around the church. But, you know, it was interesting. It was so easy to go to the bar, but then I always wanted to leave or go somewhere else. But I never wanted to go to the church, but once you get in the church, you don't want to leave. In the presence of Jesus, there is peace. There is healing. There is hope. There is fullness of joy. And church, as we declare Jesus is coming and be courageous and and do not fear, things begin to happen. I said things begin to happen. What are we as a church declaring to the world? What are we as a church declaring to one another? We are needing to enter in to the presence of God and then ask everyone else, enter into the presence of the Lord, and those things will disappear. But let's continue here in verse, the next slide here. We're going to continue in verse 7. Actually, ends off in, it says, for water will gush in the wilderness, in streams, in the desert. I love that. When Jesus shows up, it ain't going to be just a little shower, uh, I mean, a little rain. Like, it's going to flood the whole area, and not literally for the bad, but for the good, and all these plants are going to come up. The parched ground will become a pool of water, and the thirsty land springs of water. Ooh, hold on just a second. Look at me for a minute. When the presence of God comes up, where it's been dry, where the well has been barren and dry, springs of water are going to come out. That's exactly what Jesus says happens to us when we come into his presence, even now. He says, oh, if you believe in me, there will be springs of living water that spring out of you. There should be no Christians that are unfruitful. There there should be no Christians that are barren. There should be no Christians that are in dryness. And if we are, church, it's because we're not in his presence. You know, the only thing Jesus told us to work at is to enter into his presence, enter into his peace. That's the only thing we're supposed to really truly work at is make sure that you have entered in to my peace, my shalom, what I have done. Church, so often, we do everything for God, don't we? We're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're still dry. We're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're still empty. We're doing this, and we're doing this, and we still don't have peace in our lives. And we're like, we're doing all this stuff for the church. We're all supposedly doing this for God, but I still, I'm not full. I'm not satisfied. I, I still am lacking something. And that's why the rich man, you remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and He says, what am I supposed to do to be saved? And Jesus says, you know the law, go and do it. He's like, man, I've obeyed the law. And Jesus says, ah, you're lacking something. Follow me. Get rid of everything that's hindering you and follow me. Come on, church. How important is Jesus' presence? And if you're barren and dry in his presence, not just streams, springs, rivers are going to flow out of us. So we need his presence, don't we? It continues here. The parched ground will become a pool of water, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, in the haunt of jackals, in their lairs there will be grass, reeds, and papyrus. 
a road will be there and a highway. Now, I'm going to, let's look at this, the haunts of jackals. You know, there's some hidden places in this world, isn't there? There's some truly barren, if you will, wicked, mm, ugly places in this world. Literally, this is talking about a den of a pack of wild beasts, if you will. Your translation might be dragon or something else. But literally, this is a very secret um, den, a den of iniquity, a den of death. And it says, even in this place, there's going to be life. There's not going to be one place untouched. <laughs> Amen. There ain't going to be one place untouched when Jesus Christ shows back up. Every place Everything in secret will be revealed in public. Everything will be illuminated by the presence of Jesus Christ, church. Oh, glory, hallelujah. And I'm telling you, even the dark places of our soul as well, everything is covered in his return, isn't it? I just, I just love that. There's going to be life where there's death. In verse 8, it says, a road will be there and a highway, literally in the Hebrew, this is a high road. This is an elevated path. And so this is actually talking about a physical pathway up in the air. I don't understand what that's going to look like, but it's some kind of elevated road. I remember we were in Singapore, and they had these trains that uh, were elevated up off the ground. And, and uh, as, you, as you drove, you could, you, you, it was kind of hard. You had to get up there, but once you were up there, you could go over everything here. But this is literally in the Hebrew, a highway, an elevated road. It will be called the holy way. It says here, the unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for the one who walks the path. I'm telling you, what path is that? It's the path of Jesus. It's the path of Jesus, church. And even the fool will not go astray. Here, look at me for a second. It says that the, when Jesus comes back, there's going to be literally a path that leads to his throne. It's the millennial reign of Christ. There's going to be a path that leads only to Jesus Christ, and you've got to be following. You've got to be, it's going one way, church. It's going to Jesus. And even the fool, <laughs> even the fool will not go astray. Well, why is that? Because there's only one way into Jesus. Amen. Church, so often uh, we're foolish, aren't we? So often the world is foolish. So often we stray from the path of Jesus. But when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to clearly have a, literally a super highway going right into his throne room. That's amazing, isn't it? i just imagining that. There's literally just, just abundant of flowers and a beautiful highway that we can, I don't know if we're walking on it, I don't know what, what kind of transportation we're going to have, but hey, it's going to be a good road, whatever it is. It's going to be perfect. And even a fool, even one who doesn't know any better or or thinks something differently sometimes hey his path will be straight when Jesus Christ comes back and I, and I just I just love that in verse 9 look at this in verse 9 it says there will be no lion there and no vicious beast will go up on it and they will not be found there church this is safe passage when Jesus Christ comes back literally there's going to be a road that leads right to his throne and it says, no wild beasts, there's no fear. Now, back in this day, you couldn't hardly travel with having some kind of dangers along the way. Uh, now, today, we might fear running out of gas, or we might even fear breaking down, or maybe we might even fear a, a drunk driver, or maybe even the occasional uh, whatever we write, run into. But here, it says that in those days, when Jesus Christ's presence hits earth again, there's not going to be anything in the path that's going to hinder us from also getting to him, church. That's a good word. You know, there's so often there's things that try to hinder us from coming to Jesus Christ, namely now the devil. I'm telling you, there won't be any hindrances for us to come to the throne boldly. Whew. And I'm going to look forward to that day, and I hope you do too. But we're going to continue here. Let's go to the next slide here. It says, but the redeemed say redeemed, the redeemed. This is Gaul. This is the kinsman redeemer. This is what the kinsman redeemer does. He, he rescues us. He delivers us. But the redeemed, and this is who walks the path, those that are redeemed. We need to be redeemed to be able to walk on the path. Amen. That's how you walk on the path, is we're redeemed. We'll walk on it. And the redeemed, literally, we are rescued, we are delivered, of the Lord will return. Now, this is prophecy about Israel. Israel, listen. 
listen, Israel, you're going to return. And they did, didn't they? They returned in the days of Isaiah. They, they, they also returned when Jesus Christ came back. But then also, too, now there's a hardening, but they'll return one day, church. Be assured of that. And the redeemed of the Lord will return and come to Zion, listen to this, with singing. Now, the singing in Hebrew literally means a ringing, a cry. It's a shouting. Uh, this won't be a very quiet place. When they come in, there's going to be some shouting going on. Woo! We're going to be walking in. With, wow! <laughs> it's going to be loud. Everyone's going to be rejoicing. And we're going to be crowned. Literally, this is on their heads. We're going to be crowned or on our heads with unending or literally everlasting joy or, or gladness and glee. And so when we enter into his presence, we're going to be shouting and on our heads. Now, you could take this as a literal crown, or you could take this as just our minds, our thoughts, will be everlastingly glad and glee forever. These are our thoughts. These are our our. our, our, our our intellect. This is, we're just going to be everlastingly glad and joy. This joy literally is exultation or rejoicing and gladness. That gladness is the same as that unending joy. Now, joy and gladness will overtake them, will literally overshadow us. Well, literally, it means in Hebrew to reach. And so literally, joy and gladness is going to reach and grab us. And you know what? Sorrow, which is grief and affliction, and sighing, literally just a groan or a moan, will flee. Come back to me, church, for a second. Look, this is going to be amazing. In the presence of Jesus, you're going to be shouting. Now, if Brother Terry was here today, he'd be like, hey, man, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, when you get overwhelmed by the presence of the Holy Spirit, you can't help but shout, amen, amen, and when that begins to happen, your mind, your head, you just have everlasting joy. You have everlasting glee upon you mentally. And, and it, look, I'm telling you, if you're, if you're fearful or if you got anxiety or stress in your life, just begin to think about the return of Jesus Christ. And you begin to feel his presence. And in his presence, you'll be a shouting, amen, glory, hallelujah. And your mind, your thoughts, your will, your intellect, all of this intellect inside of you will begin to be glad and joyful. I love that. And then it says here, joy and gladness will overtake them. And so this is something that you're not even going to be able to control because joy and, and, and gladness and, and, and excitement is just going to reach out and grab you. I'm telling you, in the presence of Jesus, that's what happens. You just get taken over and, and just overrun with his joy and his gladness and all sorrow and anxiety and bitterness, unforgiveness. Come on. All of that flees away. Did you see this also? It even says sighing. <sighs> now, not only does the problem go, but a lot of times we sigh because mentally we're burdened. <sighs> that leaves in the presence of Jesus. You know, I've heard it before that just one groan will reach the throne, but I'm telling you, in his presence, even our sighing, our anxieties, our frustrations melt away and are relieved. Church, his presence is so important. We need his presence now more than ever, and we need to declare to the world his presence is here. And when, when, excuse me, when, when Christ does return, I started to act like Moses and stutter for a minute. When Christ returns, all of that's going to go away. And even the barren lands will produce beautiful flowers. How much more us? How much more his people? If he's going to do this to a dry ground and dirt, little dirt is going to spring forth flowers. Church, how much more beautiful are we going to be in his presence? How much more are we going to bear fruit for him in his presence? 
even now, church, it's so important. You know, this is a prophecy about Jesus Christ coming, and this is what happened when he came the first time, but now, especially the second time, but as a believer, when you ask Jesus Christ in your life, when you ask for his presence in your life, all of that sorrow, all that grief, all that pain goes away. And what overtakes you is joy, everlasting joy, everlasting hope, everlasting love. I'm, I'm, this is real. This is not silly stuff. This is real stuff. This is things that people really need now, is the presence of Jesus now more than ever. I've got one more verse I want to show you here. It's in Psalm 16. So turn your Bibles to Psalm 16. If you know Psalm 16, you know where I'm going with this. But Psalm 16, that's all of Psalm 16. If you get a chance, read it in its entirety later. But here's Psalm 16, starting in verse 7 to verse 11. Literally, these are promises of God in his presence. Look at this in verse 7. This is in Psalm 16, verse 7. It says, I will praise or bless the Lord who counsels me, even at night, my conscience or my kidneys, my heart uh, instructs me. Did you hear that? So even at night, and a lot of times I think that's when we get the most anxious or the most fearful, and not just because of the dark, but worried about maybe what's going to happen in the morning or the next day. Church, Jesus' promises, in his presence, there's guidance, isn't there? He's going to instruct us. We need now more than ever the Holy Spirit to, to instruct us. We need to be listening, but also the presence of the Lord need and will guide us into all righteousness. I love that. Then in verse 8, I kept or literally set the Lord in my mind. Literally, always before me. Always. Church, we need now more than ever to keep and set the Lord on our mind. And that's what we do to those who are in travail, aren't we? It says, declare to those that are feeble-handed and weak knees. Hey, be courageous. Do not fear. Your God is here. Amen? We're, we're declaring to the world that God is here. We're declaring to each other and even myself. Hey, look, the Lord is here. I need to set my mind on him and his promises. This is literally stability here because it says, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken, I won't waver, I won't slip. You know, fellowship with God is a blessing, amen? It is a great blessing, which also stabilizes us, stabilizes our way, stabilizes our path, stabilizes our mind, stabilizes us to be secure and confident, hopeful and courageous and not fearful. I love that. Then in verse 9, it says here, look at this, verse 9, therefore, <laughs> I love that, therefore my heart is glad and my spirit or my glory rejoices. My body or my flesh also rests, or this is a lodging in the Hebrew, rests securely for you will not abandon me or my soul to Sheol, literally hell. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. And we know that is prophecy about Jesus Christ. But I'm, I'm telling you, church, in his presence, because we're in his presence, there's security. My flesh even is at rest. And so I don't know what you're struggling with today, mentally or physically or even emotionally, but in the presence of the Lord, there is redemption. We will be redeemed, and we are redeemed in his presence. We desperately need his presence. Remember, we talked about the Goel. Remember, we talked about Ruth and Boaz. Literally, this is something that we can't do ourselves. We can't get there ourselves. We can't restore ourselves because we're hopeless, aren't we? We need somebody to come and do it. And that's what Boaz did for Ruth, and that's what Jesus Christ has done for us. All of these have actually been fulfilled in Jesus Christ now by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can taste of this. We can taste this even now before his second return. But in his second return, everything, even the darkest den, even right now, I think maybe 
You might even be watching this on your phone in the back room of some of the darkest places. You know what I'm talking about. The establishment or the business. or You're in a building right now that is just full of evil, and you're just watching this right now. I'm telling you, in the darkest, backest rooms, when Christ comes back, there's going to be life, not death, life. And you could taste that now, even now, but you just have to ask Jesus Christ. You have to ask for his presence. You have to come in because he's a gentleman. He doesn't break down your door. He, he sits out there and knocks. I want to come in. I want to come in. I want to be with you. I want to give you a hope and a future and a life, but you have to let him in. So would you let him in today? Would you let his presence in to you today? It will be well with you. In verse 10, for you will not abandon me to hell. You will not allow your faith one to see decay. Now, this is totally, we know this prophecy about Jesus. When he died, death couldn't hold him. He came back from the dead. And then he says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you for all eternity. And so he's setting up heaven for us right now. I love that. He's setting it up for us, church. And so we're going to dwell with him forever and ever. But he wasn't bound to death, hell and the grave, and neither are we now. Death is not something to fear. The grave is not something to fear. And we've had so many people that have died and died and died and died. I envy them. I envy them. They're, they're in the presence of the Lord right now. We are to be all the more pitied, aren't we? Death is not something to be fearful of. It's something to be rejoicing in. This is only temporary. When Christ comes back, everything's going to be fixed. But as soon as you're in his presence, everything's fixed. Everything's fixed. And so what are you waiting on? Would you give your heart to Jesus today? Would you trust in him that he is bigger than all of your problems? Would you trust in him that he's even bigger than your sin? No matter what, he won't let you go to hell. I thought for the longest time I, I couldn't be saved. I was too bad. I thought I had sold my soul to the devil. You can't. Christ purchased my soul on Calvary, on the cross. He purchased my soul. I have no control to sell it. I have no control to sell it. But I had the choice, though, to say, you know what? I don't want to suffer the consequences of all this bad stuff I've done. I want to trust that Jesus did it for me. As hell couldn't hold him, hell's not going to hold me now. Amen, church? We can be in his presence forever, ever more. But do you want it? He wants to give it to you. In verse 11 here, this is amazing. Of course, we receive the promise of resurrection in those verses. But look at it, verse 11. It says, you revealed or show me, showed me the path of life. Here it is. In your presence is fullness or abundant joy. In your right hand are eternal pleasure forevermore. You see this, church? In the presence of Jesus, sin can't hang out. In the presence of Jesus, death can't hang out. In the presence of Jesus, sickness, dying, travail, all the bad can't hang out. So in his presence, there's an abundant amount of joy. There's no sorrow in Jesus' presence. There's no grief. In the presence of Jesus, there is no anxiety in the presence of Jesus. When his presence comes, you will be overwhelmed and literally overtaken by the Holy Spirit. We shout glories because there's nothing that can't be accomplished by him. There's nothing that you're worried about that can't be fixed by the creator of the universe. And here it says, in his presence, there are all these blessings. There's all this redemption you will be redeemed in his presence. And in his right hand are eternal pleasures. Now, we know that the pleasures in sin are only for a season. Amen? Yeah. But pleasures in God are everlasting. Everlasting. I remember when I was a little kid, I went to a church camp, and you know, it was only for a week. And I didn't want to go. You know, I was having so much fun with my friends and it just seems like life a lot of times ends, right? You're in a season of your life where you have a lot of friends and family, and it's good. And then all of a sudden, it just seems like it all, it all disappeared or it all went away. Or people moved, and maybe sometimes we seek a, a time or a former time in our lives where we liked that time, but then it went away. 
I'm telling you, in the presence of Jesus is everlasting. And so this everlasting fellowship that we have, church, is unending. How much more should we love one another, church? I know we were talking about this in Sunday school today, but y'all got to put up with me forever, all eternity. I'm going to be in the presence of Jesus, and so are you, and so I've got to, hey, let's be thankful. You know, even if I'm not the pastor here at Mercer Baptist Church, I'm in the kingdom. Even this week, I'm fixing to go to a funeral of a friend of mine. Hadn't seen him for years. Hmm, my brother was only 50 years old. He had a lot of travail, a lot of troubles in his life. But he's with Jesus now. All of that is gone. All of that bad is gone. Even all of his foolishness is gone. And I pity him. I pity myself, actually. That's, he gets to experience this, and I don't yet. But I will one day. And even right now, the presence of the Holy Spirit can be with us, church. So right now, in your quiet moment, would you ask for the presence of God to be upon you? Would you ask for the presence of Jesus to be with you? The Bible says, Paul, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He will save you, church. So I speak to you now today. Be courageous. Do not fear. Your God is coming and is already here with vengeance and retribution, and he will save you. So right now, would you just cry out to the Lord? Say, Lord, save me. Lord, come in to me. Lord, be in my presence. May I be in your presence, Lord. Help me. This preacher said, in your, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Lord, you know I've been sad. Overtake me with your presence. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray even right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you begin to feel his presence, and he overruns you with joy, overruns you with shouting and singing, and fullness of joy will be upon your mind, upon your heart, and upon your lips. And all God's people said, amen. Well, church, thank you for joining us today. Hey, if you will, let's proclaim to the world of how much God loves us. Would you like or share this video with your friends? Or would you simply today go out and declare to a hurting, dying world, be courageous, do not fear. Vengeance is coming with him. Retribution is coming with him. Don't, don't sweat those people. Hey, God will save you. Declare that to the world, folks, and you're going to see some supernatural, amazing things begin to happen in the presence of Jesus. Well, I pray God continues to be with you today as you're blessed with your families. Church, we love you, and I miss you, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless. Amen.